A very warm welcome, everyone. My name is Axel Threlfall. I'm editor-at-large with Reuters based out of London. Uh, I'm thrilled to be hosting another conversation for the Alatia Foundation podcast series and delighted to welcome Morocco's Minister of Energy Transition and Sustainable Development, Dr. Leila Benali. Minister, uh, a very warm welcome to you. Thanks for talking with us. Uh, and we've got lots to talk about, the broad energy mix, the renewables targets, and uh, of course, the rather more newsy matter of uh, where Morocco's gas will come from. But let, let's start with the broader picture. G give us a sense, Minister, first of just how dramatically the country's energy mix has shifted from, from one dependent on fossil fuels, uh, on fossil fuel imports, uh, to one uh, with a mix driven to a large extent by renewables. Thank you very much, dear, dear Axel. Thank you for the, for the invitation. And it, I think it's a real, real pleasure to participate in this uh, Atiya Foundation podcast because also I believe that uh, Minister Atiya was one of the founding fathers of uh, of the LNG market. So I think it's it's a double pleasure to be with you today. And and, and to answer your question, I that's the reason why I'm talking about LNG is because Morocco's strategy since 2009, um, and that was it was a national energy strategy that was launched by our king Mohammed VI is really to accelerate the penetration of renewables in, in the electricity system. So the installed capacity in Morocco has doubled in the last 10 years, roughly. And that has, because we had that ambitious uh, target on, on renewable installed capacity, our electricity mix has also become increasingly diversified. And now we, we integrate several uh, energy technologies. We have the CSP plants, the PV plants, wind, of course, and natural gas with the CCGTs. And um, a similar trend happened in other major consuming sectors. So, for example, in agriculture, we pushed we, agriculture, which is a key sector for Morocco. We pushed for solar pumping to really free up uh, the consumption of, of, of fossil fuels. And as in other countries, of course, we are taking advantage today of the post-COVID recovery to target those hard to abate sectors namely the industry and, and logistics to diversify that mix even more. And, and I, want to, I want to get into some detail on, on each of these, these renewable bits, but just first on the targets themselves, I believe I'm right in saying 50 or 52% uh, by 2025, 70% of the mix by 2040, 80% by 2080. J tell me first up how you, how you plan to get to 52% in three years. Well, I mean, breaking news. I, I think we are, we are we have already achieved that. I mean, it's part of of, of, of the installed capacity that we have today. Um, as of last year, we were already at more than forty five percent of of renewable capacity, and we have um, in our investment plan that was adopted for the for the next eight, eight years. So going to twenty thirty, we have more than ten gigawatts of uh, of renewables planned. Part of it is with the IPPs, and another part of it is really uh, with uh, the, the the law, the, the the private sector that is involved. So there was a lot of work on the regulatory framework that will accelerate the penetration of renewables. So I would say that the first 42% that we already reached were the most difficult to get. Yeah. So now that we have the the regulatory framework in place. Our job is to accelerate that 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 framework. So that's why I'm not too concerned about bringing more renewables into the installed capacity in the next few years because the regulatory framework in there is there now. And the Thank last you. point yeah. is Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. the penetration of natural gas into the system because that will help achieve getting beyond the installed capacity to increase the share of renewables in the generation of of, of the electricity mix. Yeah, and I'll come to natural gas in, in a second. But just to uh, clarify, you're still on target for 70% by 2040, 80% by, by 2080. Is that right? Or are you going to get there much more quickly? Uh, well, I mean, we are in the progress of, of putting together, uh, of evaluating what our, strate our national strategy of sustainable development, in which we will provide uh, a clear roadmap of all the trade-offs that the government have to make in the next five years, actually, to reach some targets, including uh, the 70% of renewables uh, by, by the time frame that we want. But 
the the thing the the issue here is that over the next 10 years which is what we are looking at between now and, and 2030, 2032 we really want to accelerate that 52% target and to reach it with before 2020-25 so that's why now we are mostly focused on the medium term but for the long term there's a modeling exercise that is ongoing and we will provide it once we present it to the prime minister hopefully by february or or march of this year Okay, very good. Let, so looking specifically then at the, the different bits, solar, uh, wind, hydro, um, I, I believe I'm right in saying you have the world's largest concentrated solar power station in, 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 in your country. How, how important first is solar to this mix? How much, in, how much investment are we seeing into, into that bit? And, and, uh, and how much of the overall um, uh, mix does solar, uh, does solar provide? Right. Of the overall mix, I mean, today what we have, you mentioned the words as the CSP plants that, that you mentioned, it's a, it's a complex that was really a, a trademark for Morocco. It's, it's part of our brand for, for renewables. So it has a total capacity today of roughly 600 megawatts, that 580 megawatts to be more precise, that was commissioned in the period of 2016, 2018. So at the time where uh, oil prices were still, I would say, manageable. Uh, but today it represents that 580 megawatts of CSP represents 15% of the installed renewable capacity, just CSP. Uh, but at the same time, you're, and you're right to mention uh, the, the share in terms of the electricity mix, uh, CSP contributed to 4% mm -hmm. of the electricity mix in terms of energy, but it really allowed the integration of solar technology in the electricity mix, and it allowed our system operator to uh, start integrating uh, large chunks of uh, solar uh, uh, CSP and now increasingly PV into the mix. And okay, so that's solar. What, what about wind and hydro? How 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 quickly is that being uh, introduced into this mix? And what's the proportion now? What are the numbers there? Right. I mean, uh, the renewable energy programs that uh, we have made it possible. I mean, as of today, when it comes to wind, we have roughly 1500 megawatts installed at the end of 2021. But that is progressing very, very fast. As I said, the, re the regulatory framework is there and the private sector is very excited to join, particularly when it comes to wind uh, energy in the coming years. So we have an investment plan that I think is probably too low of, of an installation of, of 10 gigawatts uh, over the next uh, few years. Uh, and again, with a mix of, of IPPs and, and within, the, within the regulatory framework that we have as well, but we're also exploring opportunities in offshore wind because mm -hmm. most of the private sector coming from neighboring countries and European countries are is mostly interested in offshore winds to export, of course, electricity into Europe. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, oh, what, just very quickly before we, we shift tack, what what are the biggest challenges would you say in 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 terms of expanding these renewables? I mean, you mentioned the regulatory frameworks in place. What what about infrastructure and the right infrastructure and enough infrastructure and the right investment for infrastructure to make all of this possible? Right, I think that's a key point. I, I think when it comes to when I said the regulatory framework is in place, the regulatory framework is in place to ensure that whoever wants to invest can invest. Right. However, I think that we still have some areas that we are identifying as we grow, uh, as we grow the system and investments, where we want to ensure that the, the investors, when they come, they have some sort of one stop shop to talk to, which can facilitate all the issues around access to land, uh, where it's very easy for investors to do business and to be able to take basically the technology risk so that the state and the government can focus on providing all the, uh, the, the facilities and, and the framework that they need to ensure that investment is there. So I think that's an area where we are still working on, but we are making sure that we are accelerating that so that investors who would want to uh, come to, to, to invest in, in this market have all the means they, they, they would want to do that. So that with that comes transparency on costs, transparency on transaction costs, on access to the network, that we want to ensure that the, the investors have 
not only when they invest in, in, in the, I would say, industrial areas or highly connected areas, but also in the remote areas. And mind you, the areas where we have the highest potential in Morocco and potentially the highest potential in the world in terms of renewable is in the southern part of the country, in, 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 a, in, a, in the Sahara. So that's an area that is very, where, where investors have shown a lot of interest. So we want to make sure that they have all the means they, they, they have to invest uh, in that area. Um, I'd like to talk um, about the gas situation, if I could, and, and, and how you plan to secure supply. You know, I think my, if I'm right in saying the, the, the expected rise in Morocco's consumption, um, three billion cubic meters, I think, by, 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 by 2040 was a number I saw. Of course, we've all heard the reports that Spain has agreed to supply LNG via the Maghreb pipeline. What, what is the latest uh, on this and what, what sort of deal have you got in place with Spain? Uh, well, I mean, I, I would not want to get into the details of all the discussions that we're having with all the partners that are involved in this deal, because it's not with one country, it's with several right. suppliers. I mean, the whole point here, and I've been insisting on that since I became minister, is we want to access the LNG market, and that's why I pay tribute to Minister Atia, is to have access to diversity of supply and to have access to security of supply. So I think the whole point here is to ensure that we have a sustainable uh, a commercial uh, agreement that will enable us to have that security of supply. So I think on natural gas, we made a lot of progress uh, since October of, of, of last year that I think we don't have time to detail here. But the whole point here is to ensure that we have the first molecule that comes from the international market is as competitive as possible to unlock demand. So the number that you cited in terms of, of I think it was 3 BCM, yeah. I believe in demand elastic, elasticity, Axel. So for me, as long as this first molecule is very competitive, that's the most important point. Fine. Then we can talk about what are the projections in terms of demand. Yeah. How much more expensive are the imports versus the Algerian pipe gas? Oh, well, we let's get this first molecule first before I can I can answer that question. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough, Minister. How quickly do you think you can get uh, an FSRU, your own floating terminal, in place for for, for imports? I I know things. I believe things are progressing on Mohammed Airport. Um, what, what's the latest thinking on timing on this? Right. The latest thinking is that we are having, we are working in parallel tracks, three tracks in parallel. Uh, we have the molecule track that will ensure that we have at least, I mean, we're not going to buy spot. Uh, hopefully it's going to be a, a medium term contract that will enable us to have, as I said, the most competitive LNG possible. Bear in mind the condition of the market that we have today uh, with the prices that we have today. Um, we also have the parallel track, second parallel track, which is the infrastructure, and that's a combination of the existing infrastructure that, that is underutilized, plus having a regasification in Morocco, be it a floating terminal to enable flexibility if possible, or a land-based terminal. So that's quite key for security for Morocco. And then the third track is to ensure that we have, again, the regulatory framework to enable uh, uh, the development of, of a gas market that is not being locked. Uh, it doesn't stop at the three BCM that you mentioned. I mean, how, how promising do things look with regards to your own uh, production, your own the development of your own gas fields? Uh, well, I mean, I think Morocco's production today is around 100 million, million cubic meters a day. Uh, and my position is very clear. As long as we don't have, I mean, we've seen other countries that have embarked in uh, gas monetization programs and have committed to export long-term export contract, long-term contracts for their domestic industries and power sector. And sometimes it didn't go very well. So as long as we don't have at least 20 years or 30 years of demand in terms of proven reserves, our national energy strategy is not dependent on domestic resources. So we allow uh, uh, upstream players to come and take the geological risk that they want to take. We make sure, again, that the state, the government provides all the means for them to invest in, 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 in exploration and hopefully in production. Uh, however, we don't want to be we, we don't want to be linked to, to that geological risk in our uh, energy strategy. I, I'd be interested, just a few more questions, Minister. I'd be interested to, to get your thoughts on 
what we heard from the EU a couple of days ago in, in terms of going ahead with plans to label gas as green in its in its uh, uh, sustainable finance tax on, taxonomy. What I mean, clearly there is opposition to this. What are your thoughts generally on 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 that? I think we uh, we also I mean we are very much convinced of the importance of natural gas in the energy transition. I think if there's one country, uh, I mean, I don't want to cite other countries, but if there's one country that is very much convinced of that, and that was one message that we provided at the COP26, um, it's very important to have access to flexible gas because gas is a flexible energy source that can accompany in our mix the integration, massive integration of renewable energy and the decarbonization of industry and logistics, as I said, the hard to abate sectors, it plays an important role. So we, of course, we welcome uh, uh, the, the labeling of natural gas uh, as a transition energy because of its potential to contribute to the decarbonization of, of the economy. Natural gas and, of course, with nuclear and, and, and European Green Deal. Yeah. How are, how are, yeah, we, we talk about the, the, the transition, which of course implies change in, in these other sectors, the con consuming sectors. You talk about the hard to abate sectors. How are those sectors responding to what's expected of them in, in Morocco? They're responding very well because they have been involved in the first place. Remember, Morocco is a country where energy uh, prices were quite relatively high. So the issue of competitiveness of the industry and competitiveness of the logistical sector was quite key. And in our new development model that we uh, that we uh, finished last year, that is uh, that was a great experience in, in in saying how can Morocco as a country escape the middle income trap of 3% GDP growth rate to the 6% GDP growth rates, uh, we will need to unlock the potential and the competitiveness of those sectors. So these sectors are have been responding very well. And again, I, I rely on the national strategy for sustainable development to provide us with all uh, the, the, I would say, the metrics to uh, accompany those sectors very well in, in, in this path towards sustainable development. Final question, and this is on plans on for green hydrogen, green ammonia. I, I believe you you recently revealed plans to to to, to produce both. Uh, the IEA has said that green hydrogen, I quote here, is ready for the big time. I think it was Fatih Birol said that. Um, what sort? Of, but he did, of course, say he, he, governments need to to invest the right sorts of right right amounts of money into 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 this sort of thing what how how seriously are you taking this space and and, and you know how how much investment are we going to see in morocco well i mean uh, we take this of course very seriously because the potential is there i mean everybody tells us that we have a significant potential uh, and we have an optimal geographical position and mind you with the covid uh, the pandemic, the triple crisis that we had during the pandemic, the, the health crisis, uh, the financial and economic crisis remind us of the need to shorten supply chain to supply chains. And I think with the exceptional renewable resources that we have, we have all the ingredients to become a major player. Um, so we are exploring, of course, all the innovations that uh, that are there in that in that market. And we have taken several actions. Um, we have uh, an industrial project that that is being launched. Uh, and we have the national hydrogen cluster that is, that is just being created. We want to ensure that we have the, uh, an emergence of a competitive green hydrogen sector. Uh, however, we really want to ensure that we do that as on a portfolio basis. Uh, so that's why I insist also again on gas, because that portfolio approach will enable us that is sustainable economically as well for us and for the investors that are embarking with us. On, on the hydrogen path, the hydrogen and ammonia as well. So I think the economics uh, of, of green versus blue versus pink hydrogen are quite important. And it's really the role of the state, of, of the government to facilitate private invest, investment. But to do that uh, while limiting as much as possible the technological and, and financial risks to make sure that everybody, that those contracts are sustainable in the medium term. 
Okay, Minister Benali, uh, I, I've got to stop us there. We could go on a lot longer, but m many, many thanks for talking with us. And on behalf of the LATF Foundation and indeed on, on behalf of Reuters, I want to thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, thank you uh, to everyone out there for listening. Be sure to keep up to date with uh, all of the uh, Alatia Foundation's uh, work uh, by following on Twitter and on YouTube. I'm Axel Threlfall for Reuters. We'll see you again soon.